Yes, hi everyone. My name is Dan Kromlin. I have the honor to introduce the next speaker. And our next speaker is Leonard Smith, uh, who's professor of engineering at Virginia Tech in the US. And he's uh, joining us today uh, online. And I see already his, uh, his, his opening slide. Um, so before joining Virginia Tech, not, not so long ago, uh, he was a professor of statistics at uh, the London School of Economics where he led the Center for the Analysis of Time Series for almost two decades. Um, and he was also a Senior Research Fellow in Mathematics at the University of Oxford. Um, his uh, research uh, covers a lot, of, a lot of different topics, and, and uh, I'm not going to try to, to summarize all of that, but just to mention a couple of topics most relevant here is uncertainty in modeling and prediction of nonlinear dynamical systems, uh, probabilistic forecasting, weather and climate prediction, and more. So, good morning, Lenny. I hope you can hear me. Um, if you, good morning. we can hear you just briefly. Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great. Okay, uh, the floor is yours, uh, Lenny. Please go ahead. Well, thank you very much, and it's very nice to be here. Thanks for that introduction. I think one of the reasons that, as you notice, I, I look at many different things is that I'm really interested in the quantification of uncertainty and insight uh, and actually doing that in practice. So this talk will differ a bit from the last talk in that I'm much more, I'm focusing more on the communication of uncertainty and insight in actual decision support issues. So while I, I'll actually touch on relative entropy and intractability, uh, I will, I'll talk a little bit more about how we communicate those ideas. Uh, these are the people who supported this talk. In fact, also on this for this talk should be uh, a couple of dozen members of offices of the US Congress and uh, quite a few chief scientists in the UK. Oops. So what I really want to talk about is, uh, is opacity. Opacity is sort of a kind of uncertainty that often arises because we don't really communicate the fidelity and strength of our scientific evidence clearly enough. We don't communicate what the strengths and weaknesses of the results that we're giving, where they can be applied and where, where they shouldn't be done as home, to quote the last speaker. So we can actually increase opacity by mistaking one kind of uncertainty for another, or by making hiding statistical manipulations, even if those manipulations are justified. A big issue here is confusing the best available model with a model that's adequate for purpose. And then I'll touch also on this issue of known neglected, things that the modelers know, but that the impacts of which, the existence of which doesn't always come through. The problems with opacity is when you under, once this is revealed, it can end up to undermining confidence and a loss of trust in the as good as it gets science, the really solid science, as well as any somewhat oversold modeling results. So I'll first talk about different types of uncertainty and the origins of these uncertainty. And then I'll try to talk about a transition, which I call going from model land, right, when we're in our models into the real world. That can be other sciences, that can be applications of science, or it can be politics. And the impacts of opacity or this hesitancy due to the failure to communicate, right? It gives, it gives a, a lack of confidence. We can confuse as good as it gets science with the best available science. And so here we have a picture of the comet. The comet was an aircraft built in Britain, which started falling out of the sky. It was pretty much designed with as good as it gets science, but we discovered metal fatigue, right? Whereas the graph on the right, is projecting the, uh, the changes in working hours in the last 10 years of this century due to climate change under a particular scenario. And we really don't have the fidelity in our climate models, even if our economic models were perfect. Opacity can also yield to misrepresenting scientists who quantify the fidelity of a simulation as not believing in climate change. And I think what we really want to do is decrease opacity. We can have more effective discussions in Congress or other governments, we can have more achievable goals within science and improved resource allocation. We get more relevant modeling across disciplines where we actually don't assume things on the, the level above or below that weren't true. 
we can improve the public understanding of science. And I think it will generally lead to just a nicer discussions within the science itself. So usually when we talk about uncertainty, we're talking about one of the links in this chain, right? We have different links in climate science. We have the growth of uncertainties inside these individual links, whether it's emissions or concentrations, all the way down to risks in the policy loop. But opacity tends to grow between these links. And let me first talk about what the uncertainties are and then show how opacity can grow. So in precision, then precision is what we often, what physicists often mean by uncertainty, not economists. It's a well-defined value, which is considered imprecisely known. So the acceleration of gravity at the Hague, the mass of the French kilogram, which used to be one kilogram, but isn't anymore, right? Probabilistic weather forecasts in the future, we really aim to quantify the impact of imprecision by sampling initial conditions. So here's an example, right? What we have is a ball of three different balls and points showing different initial conditions. And we're gonna, evolve, we're gonna evolve those balls, those ensembles of initial conditions forward and see how they spread out. And some days like the green ball, they don't spread out very much. And other initial conditions like the red ball or the blue ball, these are spreading out a lot. And our ability to predict the imprecision with which we know the future in this situation really changes depending on where we are. And we can make probability forecasts that are useful as probability forecasts. But this actually depends on the fidelity of our model. Ambiguity, on the other hand, naivety and uncertainty, is we have a well-defined value, but we lack sufficient information to actually pose it as a probability distribution. So if the best available models we have have serious mathematical flaws, then the model-based probability distributions aren't really adequate for good decision support. So what does that look like? Well, in this case, we have the identical initial conditions. So there are two sets of identical conditions on each of these balls, but the equations are slightly different. And here the best available model cannot produce decision relative probabilities. Why not? Well, suppose we evolve these same initial conditions under reality, and also under our model, what happens is that the distributions separate. The relative entropy between these distributions can be huge. So the distribution of our model doesn't reflect the distribution of what uncertainty would be was it evaluated under reality, if there is such a thing. Okay. So our models can help us understand the dynamics of the system but they aren't actually able to provide decision relevant probability forecasts. We can explore options and pathways. We can try to look for precursors and vulnerability, but we can't make a distribution which we would then want to optimize action under. <clears throat> so a huge problem here is when imprecision, naivety and uncertainty is confused with ambiguity, right? When we, sorry, so when we actually get this, dif this difference in one level, when we pass on, we tend to think of things more as imprecision, not even risk. Uh, and that's a huge source of opacity. What's intractability? Intractability reflects a quantity that can be precisely defined, which beyond our current ability to estimate with some quantified precision. So the billionth digit of pi, right? That is a well-defined number, integer but we don't know what it is, or the smoothness of the Navier Stokes equations. There are some things that we know we can't compute today. And then indeterminacy, on the other hand, is a quantity which in fact is not uniquely defined, the location of electron. It's not that it's uncertain, it's indefinite, right? The drag of the, of the ether, there is no ether, right? The worth of a forest, this is a question of human values. There is no unique answer. So some things are simply not defined uniquely if they're defined at all. So let's go on. Let me, let me give you an example of undetractability due to technological constraints. So here we have the altitude observed by satellites minus the altitude in HADCM3. It's sort of a workhouse climate model for the last 10 or 20 years. And what we see is there is a two kilometer wall of rock 
which is in the world and not in Hadzium 3. Now, it's not that we don't know how to simulate rock, but we've decided not to simulate rock adequately, accurately, in order to achieve some other goals. And this is a known neglected, right? Climate modelers, weather modelers, people understand why these choices are made, but the impacts of these choices are not always obvious once we move down the decision stream. So a more open discussion of these limits to fidelity, right? When would this become important? How far into the future can we go? That's gonna depend on whether or not we're interested in rainfall in the Amazon, right? Air can flow right over this two kilometer, this missing two kilometers where actual air will not be able to. So how can we actually discuss not just what the model says, but the limitations in what the model says? When we actually show this to decision makers, when they learn this, then they often experience a loss of confidence. They're not quite sure what they can count on and what they can't. And that can be independent of the impact of the particular shortcoming of the model. Sometimes these impacts are very minor, arguably very minor, but we need to actually explain what they are in the context of the decisions that are being made. So here's a very common schematic about modeling the climate system, which shows what's included. Now, I've done a work with a Norwegian insurance company that was interested in snowfall. And if we look at the model that was generating those results, the squares represent the grid points of that model. And the question was about snowfall on this mountain range. But what you see here, these details are what are not in the model. You can't worry about tsunamis and fjords. Like if this whole area of Norway is represented by one point in the climate model. So we need to clarify you know, what's been included and contrast that with what's being realistically simulated. If we can do this early on in the process, then we get a better idea than if people come away with the models actually looking at you know, very large turtles, sharks or dolphins, I can't quite tell. Now, of course, we can't communicate everything. We don't even know everything, but there's still a lot of achievable goals in that we could do, that I believe we could do better in. You know, some unknowns are inconceivable. We can't even think about it. And even as good as it gets, science can prove incomplete. So the comet disaster, right? The comet was a very well engineered aircraft. We can argue that what we learn in the comet disaster was actually new science, fundamentally new science. What we really want to worry about is communicating the uncertainties that we know are already there. So the details of how models work and the strong science in which they are based, we can never fully communicate that to decision makers as long as they're staying primarily decision makers. But on the other hand, if we fail to distinguish ambiguity from imprecision, or if we promote the simulation as being from the best available model, when we actually know that model is not thought adequate for the purpose the decision maker is trying to use to use it, the result, this undermines the application of science in support of decision making. So now I'd like to go on and talk about probabilities for just a second. I'd like to talk about maintaining the distinction between two different types of probability, three, four, maybe Six to 65,000 different types of probability. So our traditional view of probability, I'd like to introduce Laplace's demon. From, 18, from 1814, Laplace was very careful to give his demon three properties. It had perfect equations of motion. It had perfect noise-free observations. And he also gave it unlimited computational power. Now I'd like to introduce the demon's apprentice which appeared uh, in my book in 2007. So she has perfect equations of motion, but she no longer has noise-free observations. But on the other hand, she has a perfect noise model and she also has unlimited computer power. This means that she can make very, very good probabilistic predictions. Whereas Laplace, if the world is deterministic, would give precise point predictions. And if the world is stochastic, I don't think Laplace would have a problem with quantum mechanics. The key is he would give perfect probabilistic predictions. But we don't have perfect equations of motion. We're more like the novice, right? We don't yet have the perfect equations of motion. We don't have perfect noise-free observations. I'm gonna say we still have unlimited computer power. What could we do? 
Well, Laplace has the best probability distributions available. They would arguably govern, not just describe. Whereas the, 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 the apprentice, her conditions are conditioned on the data available, which is not perfect, and the laws of physics. So the information she has is incomplete, but it's true. But the position we're in are closer to that of the apprentice, right? We have, we're trying to make forecasts of X based on data, which is imperfect. And G, where G is a useful approximation, it's insightful, it tells us things about the way the system works, but it's still known to be false. And this is a, this brings up, brings up some really difficult questions. For the demon's apprentice, we have as good as it gets science. There are no big surprises. Her one in a million events happen once in a million times. But for the apprentice, we expect big surprises. Some of them, we might be able to see them coming, but how do I use the probability of X conditioned on faults as a probability distribution to making decisions? I can use information, but how do I actually get? Um, well, how do I use that? I mean, this is still a problem I struggle with. And while we're here, let's ask the question, what do I mean by a big surprise? So big surprises occur when something that our simulation models can't mimic turns out to have implications, which are really important to us. In weather forecasting, we can see the lead times at which our models become silly, where they just don't look realistic at all. But in climate forecasting, we're forecasting into the dark. We never actually get to evaluate our models after having seen how they perform because the lifetime of the model is short compared to the lead time of the forecasts. If we did many different models and they agreed, at least in distribution, you know, would we have more confidence in their simulation? So here's an idea. What if we put our climate systems, our climate centers in different space stations and didn't let them talk to each other? Right? So the models were developed independently. Do we think we'd see simulations converge even in distribution? So for weather, I think yes. I expect we would see our simulations get more and more similar. But for climate, I don't think I would live to see this convergence occur. I think we get more and more insight. We'd understand things more and better, but different stations might go off on, in different directions. And we may not get that convergence even on the time scale of 20 years. That means we just have to make decisions based upon the information we have now. This is not new. Right, Whitehead, <clears throat> Whitehead came on about the his fallacy of misplaced concreteness. That you know it's really useful to model things, but it's of the utmost important to be vigilant and criti and critically revising. He said modes of abstraction, but then he was writing quite a long time ago. We could say models. Whitehead here was actually criticizing the straitjacket of the formation of Newtonian science, one of the most successful paradigms of all time. But it, after advancing science, it then constrained the ways we could look forward. And I think computer simulation can impede both the progress of science and the use of science in decision support. You know, in the real world, mathematics is never rigorously relevant, at least not beyond the integers. We need to keep this distinction clear. That doesn't mean science is useless. What that means is we need to better communicate how science can be used and that all science is in fact, as Feynman said, all science is uncertain. So <clears throat> I wanna talk now about a few examples in climate science that I've observed in the last 20 years. The first one has to do with anomalies and systematic errors and how we approach the laws of physics. I see this graph as very decision relevant. It shows that a whole lot of sort of like Earth model planets warm about the same under the observed forcing. But this is what the bottles actually do. This is what the anomalies of the temperatures are. This is model temperature. This is the actual model results when you've removed the systematic error of each model and placed them on top of each other, right? So when you're expecting the yellow and you realize this is what the models actually look like, you can find some lot of confidence in your understanding of what's going on. Anomalies can be fine for motivating mitigation, but there's something of a nonsense for quantitative adaptation. The laws of physics, biology, ice melted zero degrees, this actually changes. If we lose this information when we go to anomalies. 
and learning that this wasn't temperature, right? That you were actually the yellow lines were anomalies, not actual temperatures, does not build confidence in decision makers and domain scientists down the road, statisticians who weren't aware that this in fact was what they were looking at when they were trying to evaluate the IPCC report. Now, anomalies really can be useful to reduce opacity. Here's a nice discussion between Erica Thompson, James and Anna, myself. I mean, Eric is concerned that this is really the anomaly that the climate models are only giving us a subset of possible climates. James more or less says he suspects it's a set of impossible climates, but some of them might be similar. And I, I go for the fact that this is a set of actual model climates. And it shows that every single model world remotely similar to our understanding of what our world would be like warms. And that's arguably enough. That's actually more information than decision makers often have when they go to bat. But it doesn't allow us to zoom in and make detailed forecasts or projections, forecast conditions on emission scenarios for what's gonna happen in the future. And it gets worse if in fact, we sort of hide this post-processing. So here's the IPCC report. And it's very clear that these are temperature anomalies, but in the American report, not only has it moved to Fahrenheit, but we've dropped the word anomaly, right? And this, when it then is discussed, when this difference comes up, it causes uncertainty among the, uh, among, among the people we're talking with, among the people we're trying to communicate climate science to. My examples are from climate science, but I have similar examples from many other modeling efforts in support of decision-making. So we move on to the AR5. We're a bit more forthcoming. What do we see here? Well, the anomaly period has shifted. And what are these numbers? Well, if we take these numbers on the side, these are the numbers that were actually used to estimate the offsets. If we take these trajectories and match them with these numbers on the side and add them back together, then we get the temperatures of the models. So again, trying to move between these two situations, how do we base, we can base lots of good decisions based on this information without actually needing, or we don't have agreement in the actual temperatures. I find that Kelvin's gambit can, reply, can reduce opacity significantly. Kelvin was really concerned about the age of the earth, right? And 150 years ago, discussing the age of the sun, he says, you know, as for the future, we can say with equal certainty that the inhabitants of the earth cannot long continue to enjoy the light and heat essential to their life for many millions of years, unless the sources now unknown to us of energy are prepared in the great storehouse of creation. Just clarifying this kind of assumption is a source of strength. It builds credibility with decision makers and politicians, and it can decrease opacity significantly. Learning what we, what we thought were model temperatures or actually model anomalies can lead to confusion, a loss of confidence and a hesitancy to actually move forward. So I've actually seen this occur. I've seen this occur with Jim Berger, senior academics. Jim was the head of the American Statistical Association's Climate Committee. Uh, when I showed him years ago, the orange lines and the black lines, I had found myself on the American Statistical Association's Climate Committee. Uh, Nicholas Stern wrote the UK's Climate Review for Economics and Climate Change. Again, when they were preparing their study, it wasn't made clear enough, in my view, to them what was going on, what, what aspects of the model behaviors were robust and what were realistic, right? One might not be realistic, but we're still robust, right? Making those distinctions is a way to reduce opacity. It's also true in industry, this is Trevor Maynard. He was head of emerging risk at Lloyd's of London. I'm very interested, as is Munich Re, uh, reinsurance company, in understanding what the dynamics, how the dynamics that are likely to happen or possible to happen are likely to change their business model, and even more so in the energy sector. So lead scientists, including Electricity de France, Eon, the UK National Grid, right, is trying to figure out how do we interpret high resolution interpretations, very high, right? Tens of kilometers going out 50 or 100 years when our models have these zeroth order disagreements about global mean temperature. And it's really unfair to a salesman 
if you're trying to promote or if you're commercially, if you're encouraging the commercial education on climate, it's very hard for a salesperson to actually lead with their uncertainty. The IPCC, on the other hand, in a sense, it's long acknowledged as structural uncertainty. Back in 2007 in the AR7, it discusses explicitly that certain parameterizations and model structures are just missing from the set of available models. Right? And these limitations imply that distributions of future climate responses from ensemble simulations are themselves subject to uncertainty and would be wider. I'm not sure they'd be wider. That might just be in a different place if uncertainty due to structural model errors were accounted for. So this was an attempt, this paper was an attempt to discuss how those structural model errors should change the way we view and use information from large scale models, not just climate models, right? But models generally relevant to the pol to political and industrial and even personal decision-making. The IPCC has this graph, which has become very popular. I imagine most of you, I can't see you, so I can't ask you to raise your hands. Many people have seen this graph. And the IPC has repeatedly rejected the notion that the diversity of ensembles, what is this graph? Here we have history. Here we have models running into the future. And these colored bars are showing the, the, the spread of different model results, depending on what the forcing scenario is, depending on what the emission, depending on what the concentration scenario is. Now this graph I've seen widely reproduced, but very often it's reproduced without this part of the graph. The gray bars actually show what the real world forecasts are. This is what I mean by going from model land into the real world. And if we look, right, this is the actual graph from the IPCC. If we look, this is the range of the models. And at the time, this was the range of the likely variation in global mean temperature. It's losing these details that increase opacity. On the other hand, we don't have models that run out here. And so to try to run simulations and optimize, we have we don't know. This is this is provided by expert opinion about things that are missing in our models. So I want to argue that model-based probability statements, which are focused on those ensemble members, are incomplete unless we give a quantitative measure of the likelihood that the model is irrelevant. This is what I would call the probability of a big surprise. If we get the precipitation over the Amazon wrong for 20 years, it dies, it rots 30 years, 40 years. Before we get to the year 2100, right? We have a very, very different situation than if we'd gotten the if we gotten precipitation and a different view of precipitation. The same thing can happen. This is the Okefenokee Swamp. This is Jacksonville, Florida. Here's the ocean. This used to be the coastline. Right? If we get things wrong in precept over the Okefenokee, it will have local effects, which will go to larger effects. We know these limitations are in our models. So rather than just presenting the model output for a given decision, we need to sort of couple that to how accurately we think that model can support the outputs of that model, can support information on this kind of problem. And in that sense, no presentation of model-based probabilities is complete without an expression of model irrelevance. What's the chance the model is irrelevant in 2090 in terms of the rainfall in Jacksonville or precipitation over the Amazon. <clears throat> I want to speak that the IPCC has actually moved forward in this direction. We now talk about, you know, that the, that the actual surface temperatures, right, are projected to be likely in the ranges derived by these models. And say in the real world, global mean temperature is likely 66% chance to be in the range of the model land global mean temperature. This suggests a significant chance of real world will be outside that range, just as it was before. But I think it's fair to say the IPCC implies a probability of a big surprise in global mean temperature in 2100 of something like one in four to one in 10. That said, we still end up finding graphs that look more like this. This is the projected changes in hours worked <clears throat> in the US in 2090 to 2100. This result requires detailed information on the circulation and precipitation patterns, which I would argue, and most climate scientists would argue, we don't actually have. In the fourth national assessment, the economics are called, the economic modeling is called into question robustly. 
in this report. Our ability to estimate projected hours worked. On the other hand, even if the economic models were perfect, to put in the environmental drivers that impact hours worked outdoors in Florida in agriculture, right? We don't, I don't hold that we have the information to really make projections at this scale that don't suffer from a big surprise, which is at least on that order of a quarter or a tenth. In which case, optimizing under this kind of scenario leaves something to be desired. The opacity in this graphic, right, is non-trivial. Now, it's also true policy specialists work from the other side. When you, when you move from the science all the way over into individual uh, science, uh, policy, chief scientists and decision makers, public politicians offices, offices. You see they're, they're reaching out this way to us as well. This is the Netherlands report. This is Arthur Peterson, who I've worked with a good deal. And the idea that we're looking at the, assessing the, out, the likelihood of an outcome, right? It's assessed using expert judgment. It's a fact that we have to combine, we have to include expert judgment and interpret the models. We have to move from model land into reality. And that's gonna happen, that needs to happen in the context of the particular decisions being considered. And it worked. These changes were actually made, right? We're using observations, model resorts, or board, both and expert judgment. This role of interpretation is being pushed into the IPCC for almost 10 years now, into the IPCC reports. And this is a group in the IPCC process. Governments actually see the reviews, see the drafts early, and they're allowed to actually push for questions and clarifications. This is another contribution by the Netherlands, where, let me just blow it up. They actually report back on the draft summary for policymakers that they, that they want a more transparent and consistent and uncertainty formation, right? The, so the summary for policymakers should include a clear distinction between process-based and model-based uncertainty formulation. So this process-based model uncertainty is really uncertainty in the world where we actually have it from an empirical point of view. The model-based uncertainty, that's the diversity between our models. That's a different kind of uncertainty. That's just like the blobs where the model blobs of different models may spread apart or the blob between the model and reality may spread apart. Superimposing those with anomalies make them look better, but it doesn't make them look similar, but it doesn't actually give us more information in terms of things that we can use to optimize action. Now for the last 10 years until the pandemic, Every year, I went to Capitol Hill as part of Climate Science Day. This is a large event organized by the AAAS, but in fact, it improves a whole alphabet soup of different science organizations. This is a really interesting event. And those of you who are interested in understanding more about policy, I suggest you try to find this or something similar to go to. I mean, the real question is, now, what can the scientists most usually say when visiting their congresspeople in DC, right? This was on about the fifth one. And what I think we can actually do is not try to present details of model output. We can actually find common interests. We need to discuss the impacts that really matter to them and to do so with as little opacity as possible. So this is Ted Yoho, uh, who is in the third district. The Florida third district is sort of right in the middle of Florida, right up toward the top. He's a veterinarian and he has a life-size photograph of a cow in his office. He's really interested in how changes in temperature and rainfall will affect cattle farming in this relatively small area, smaller than the Netherlands, right, in Florida. I don't have much to tell him about that, right? We can talk about possibilities, we can talk about ranges, but in terms of what is going to happen, I don't feel I can actually give him much. This is John Rutherford. He's actually uh, the representative for my hometown, <clears throat> my district until I moved to Virginia. He's very interested in St. Augustine, the oldest continuously occupied city 
in the U.S. St. Augustine is at risk from a lot of issues from the ocean. And in terms of change, likely changes, we have a lot more confidence in what, perhaps not exactly when, impacts are going to hit St. Augustine. And by just focusing on the vulnerabilities of cattle, the vulnerabilities of coastal cities, the vulnerabilities of the Netherlands, and discussing known neglecteds, and the time scales required for us to lift those known neglecteds, those time scales are long. It may be longer than the actual time it takes for us to begin to observe the impacts. And maybe some impacts we may be observing already. So it makes them realize that they actually have to make decisions before they're going to get more solid information. They have a huge number of ways of thinking about how to make those decisions. But if we can show them observational data that they can understand, I'll show you that in the next slide. And we can develop relationships with their staffers their staffers do a huge amount of the work that inform them. And in the US, their staffers tend to be quite a bit younger than they are. Many staffers have different concerns than their bosses, but working together, we can actually get information in the Capitol Hill. And also, you know, decision makers really don't require detailed probabilities. They don't really require anything, but if they do require something, all they require is a deadline. So trying to show that there are deadlines, that there are timescales, they understand that not acting is a decision. This is not new to them. Right? It's just engaging with them to see whether or not, given their our vulnerabilities and theirs, they can take that action now. This is the most effective graph I found. This is also from the US report. <clears throat> this graph shows the temperature in Fahrenheit versus the coastal western, the coastal wetlands coverage, whether it's dominated by salt marsh, like Jacksonville is, or like mangoes, uh, sorry, mangrove, as it is further south. Florida politicians understand that this is a huge transition, right? John Rutherford realizes that he and I used to go surfing, it's on the same beaches, slightly different times, outside Jacksonville. And this is the way Jacksonville is now. It would make huge differences. We don't have to talk about details to show that warmer temperatures lead to more mangroves, right? There are these issues. These are the sorts of values at risk. These are things that they can relate to, right? And we need to make sure that we talk about things that are in some sense realistic. But this kind of data I find more, I have found more effective. And we also, we need to answer their questions, but we really need to listen very carefully to their very real concerns. This is Steve Pearson. He's actually works for the American Statistical Association as a, as a paid lobbyist, but he actually knows how Congress works. He has accompanied me on each of these 10 visits. And he actually allows us to understand. So together, you know, when I first went, I really didn't understand at all of the constraints on, under either of these guys or the other dozen uh, representatives that I've met. They are working, they, they work in, an, in a situation which really does constrain them. You know, we, we yell at them to do something, but we need to understand better what those constraints actually are. And we also need to avoid confusing, confusing a leader's public attitude towards uncertainty after a decision has been made and their private attitude before the decision has been made. You know, you see these committee meetings which are just like circuses of people yelling at each other. Right? If we go into their individual offices and talk, then many of them are really quite interesting, quite interested to learn more until they make a decision. And like a good quarterback or a good general or a good politician, once they've made that decision, their public appearance doesn't admit uncertainty in the way that they may have actually considered it themselves. So what do I wish I had understood in 2001? Well, I wish I had understood the role of opacity and more ways to reduce it. You know, policy effect. Policy relevant simulation science is much more effective when we make its limitations clear from the beginning. I haven't had any pushback from revealing and explaining how models work. Opacity is reduced when known neglecteds are given a higher profile, but it helps a lot if we can do this early in the process so they know what uncertainties they're dealing with. We can convey to decision makers our levels of confidence, the limits of our insight, and vulnerability, doing this actually reduces opacity. It builds common cause if they want to move in these directions. Some do and some don't. 
we can be much more clear on what we mean by probability. These probabilities that are banded about an optimization when we know that the probabilities don't reflect that sort of Laplacian ideal or even the demon's apprentice ideal, this again throws technical discussion which then causes confusion. With our models, we can throw tests of internal consistency. This is something that's extremely useful in climate models when you're trying to see, especially with one-way coupled models, whether or not the high resolution model, the driven model still resembles a model that's driving it at all and stop when it's not. But not doing so, we need to avoid giving best available answers to questions when they're likely not to be adequate for that particular question involved. And somehow to support our understanding, this is what I'd really like to I'd like to know how to present the solid aspects of science. We understand the thermodynamics of climate really rather well, but at the same time, we really don't understand circulation changes. That's, that's a, Brian Hoskins has said, this is a challenge for the next generation. How do we communicate the solidness of some insights, even given that we don't know everything? And the last thing, and perhaps the most important, is really to learn the concerns and the constraints that the person I'm talking to is working under. This is very different for insurance companies, for energy domain companies, and for politicians on Capitol Hill or in parliament. It's interesting to see how they work and what they actually understand. And you can affect, help them much more effectively then. So I'm really curious in your talks. Thanks for your time. All right, thank you. Um, let's first, again, uh, there was at least one question in the chat, I think, and let's address that first. Okay, yes, so there was a question from Tom Verhoef who's asking how valuable is the recent result on dealing with the chaos of the three body problem to, for example, climate models or to chaos in general? How solutions to the three body problem? Okay, so <clears throat> actually Poincaré, you know, Poincaré won the prize for not solving the three body problem. The, the, the prize that he was going for was for solving the three prob body problem and he thought he had solved it, right? But then a mistake was found and he was still given the prize for showing that the problem couldn't be solved. So you can, the nice thing about the three body problem is as long as you can really assume that you're dealing with three point masses, you can quantify very, very accurately the problem of how the solutions diverge under different computational methods. As you do more and more exact computational methods, you can see to the extent to which the time scales on which the trajectories of the three bodies move forward together. But if the bodies have tidal interactions, then that just is the wrong probability distribution to compute. So it depends very much on how you try to solve the problem. A really good example that I like, I mean, suppose you had three bodies, which also had a billion golf balls out of the orbit of Pluto. And you threw all those golf balls off and you were asking in, the, in trajectories, you were modeling, where does the real golf ball go? Well, some of those golf balls will fall into the sun or become relativistic. They will do things that show that your model isn't able to say what they're going to do. But we can learn this within the model. It's what I call a purple light. And so really to address the question, I would say, we can see where different solutions yield the same trajectory for the three body problem. But if we look carefully, we can see where our different solutions diverge. And that tells us that we know we don't know. And this is a very useful, if we somehow have a decision relevant three body question. Okay, thank you. So there's a, a, a remark following up on this from uh, again, the same person, Tom Verhoef, who says there's a recent result 2019 on the three body problem that does make certain kinds of predictions possible. So, is it rejoining what you what you just said um if i may ask a question myself um sure. you were referring to the fact that um i think it was it came from the ipcc reports um there's it is likely and there was uh, i think a 66 percent chance put on that that uh, real world uh, observations fall outside the range of models so i want yeah. That's so the, 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 the likely is one thing that is likely is one thing, putting a, a 
specific percentage on that? Is it different things? I, I'm, I'm curious how, uh, how people were able to come up with that number. So it, it, that's a very interesting question. How did it happen? Well, it actually happened, in, to my knowledge, the first time it happened was with the CIA. Very early on, like in the 50s, the CIA realized that some of its reports on hazards were not being correctly interpreted. They would say there is a chance X would happen. You know, there is a, there, it is likely Castro will not shoot down a U-2. This was a sort of question. They came up with a table, which basically was the words they would use and the percentages that it meant. The IPCC has a similar table, which defines as likely as not, likely, very likely, almost certain, and virtually certain. Now, there are, there are uh, Arthur Peterson, myself, Erica Thompson, we have made comments on the aspects of this table. For me, a 99% chance that a plane will make it across the Pacific, if I had been able to fly, a 1% chance my plane would have fallen in the ocean, would have been enough for me not to fly. Yet this is considered virtually certain. So there's a lot of discussion about, I don't have the table right here. Unfortunately, I've taken that one out. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about what words we should use, but in these reports for the CIA, within some industries, within the IPCC, there is a table that relates the words to be used and the probabilities assigned, the probabilities thought to correspond to those words. Uh, and this has been this has been there for at least two cycles. Did that answer the question? Well, I'm just curious that how, how people then determine which category it falls in. I mean, this is again. The, oh, oh, okay, the, sure. Um, that's the that actually is directly into this attribution statement. So this is this is this is the this is the both and expert judgment. So this this is a this is a discussion among. Uh, the experts about interpreting a combination of of what the of what the what the models are really telling us. It's the same way they go from this distribution of model results to this distribution of likely global mean temperatures. I mean, it's an ex it's an expert discussion. Thanks. <clears throat> yes, a very interesting talk, by the way. I, I have kind of a follow-up question and more your, your general uh, remark that there should always one should always give a probability of a big surprise. So on the one hand, I think that's very nice and that uh, really recognizes this difference between quantifiable uncertainty and non-uncertainty you cannot really quantify as probability distribution. But is it even possible at all to do this in a uh, empirically... Uh, solid way. I mean, when I think of an expert giving probabilistic uh, statements, I would say, okay, this expert really clever. So he sometimes says probability 66%, sometimes 33%. And in the long run, you can see how often he is right and you can see whether he's calibrated. But these kind of predictions are inherently unverifiable. So basically my question is, what do they even mean if you say 66% probability that you go uh, of the skill. I mean, how could you trust a statement like that even? I think, I think that's, that's a great question. Thank you very much. I think it really has to do much more with what do you mean by trusting a statement like this? And how do you actually trust the model? I mean, you, you can sort of trust the model the way that a parent trusts an honest child, but you should never trust the model the way a child trusts a parent. So in the same sense, if the experts tell you it's between 70 or 80 or 90 percent, well, you think you think there is some validity in the measurements. If the experts are saying two or three or four percent, but if the, if the experts are saying the probability of a big surprise is 80 or 90 percent, then you know to discount the information. Of course, the statement comes after a Dutch statement about no weather forecast is complete without an estimation of its uncertainty. I mean, I've stolen this directly from Tenex, but the, but the idea, the main thing this flags is if we're interested in snowfall fall on the Western slopes of the mountains of Norway and the mountains of Norway don't exist in the model, then we know that the probability of a big surprise is very high. So in this sense, those probabilities are most useful. Well, they're in, they're informative if they're low, in which case you have to decide how well you think you understand. But when the probability of a big surprise is high, 
you know that the best available model is probably not adequate for your purpose. And sadly, for, for better or for worse, this is usually the role that the probability of a big supply has played for me. Okay, thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other uh, questions? Uh, I would like to uh, take the opportunity to ask another question. So you showed that I, what I got from your talk is very interesting. Thank you is among other things is that, yes, uh, like for, especially for these long-term problems, climate change, we have lots of different models. They, they, they make different predictions with different types of uncertainties, but um, like my personal opinion is that like it's often uh, very difficult, if not impossible, to predict the future, but we can still make robust decisions. And you, you can, for example, think about a decision-based model selection or like some robust way of making automated decisions that people in computer science, for example, have been looking at. And, and do you think like some kind of like robust decision support framework would that well would then lead saying, well, all these models disagree, but uh, if you if you add the signs of decision making on top of that, it's very clear that we have to do this and this and this. Do we do think uh, politicians would buy such a recommendation? As long as I don't say that you have to, then I think yes. So if, you know, when when you're looking at things like electricity demand over the next few days, the next two weeks, you can get a much cleaner estimate, a much more quantitative support for decisions about how much natural gas to buy in the forward market. You still can get an idea of when the models are more reliable or less reliable, and this is directly informative. I think a lot of the times what we need to see is those robust, as you move forward and model inadequacy becomes more important, those robust decision techniques fall apart, not because of the technique, but just because of the input that we're giving it. And what we need to find out is what are the time scales on which we can apply those robust techniques? And what are the time scales when we haven't? My own feelings and risk tolerance about climate change has not really changed in the last 20 years. I already think we had sufficient evidence to show there was high vulnerability and large risk. It's issues about trying to fine tune the response, which is sometimes can actually stop any response from happening at all. So really I would agree with you in terms of if we want to avoid major impacts that are negative, the details of which we do not know, we need to act. That message could come out quite clearly, but trying to say exactly what we need to do or when we need to do it, that's, that's a, that level of optimization I don't think can be done robustly. All right, thank you very much. Um, yeah, thanks a lot for your talk. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I understand you have a busy day ahead of you. Uh, and uh, we are moving on to the break. So thanks. Thank you.